Good evening, everyone. My name is David O'Shea. I'm an organist and a Pipeworks Associate Artist. But today I'm talking to you wearing one of my other hats, that of musicologist and music historian. On the 8th of October, just a few weeks ago, organists around the world marked the 150th anniversary of the birth of Louis the Urn, a towering figure in early 20th century French music and one of the greatest organ composers of all. Whether you were a Vierne fanatic, an aficionado or aficionada of the organ, or simply a lover of music, I hope you will find something illuminating and perhaps challenging in this talk. Today I'm going to discuss Vierne's background and early life, his influences, and in particular his role in shaping the genre that we call the organ symphony. I will discuss Vierne's first organ symphony in some detail, and this will be enhanced by musical examples performed by Pipeworks Artistic Director David Lee at the organ of St Patrick's Cathedral here in Dublin. David has also very kindly made available an archive recording of his performance of the complete first symphony from the year 2018 that you will be welcome to listen to at the end of this video. Vierne was born in Poitiers in 1870. He was born with congenital cataracts, but following two eye operations at the age of seven, he was able to see enough to, in his own words, quote, get about, recognise people, see objects at a short distance, and read large print at very close range. This was enough sight to allow him to live a relatively independent life, although as he got older, his visual impairment deteriorated and he became dependent on Braille to read and write. Vierne's musical gifts were discovered at a young age by his uncle, Charles Collan, who was the professor of oboe at the Paris Conservatoire and also an organist and composer. Charles Collan convinced Vierne's father that young Louis should become a musician. Vierne began to learn to play the piano, and when he was no more than nine years of age, he decided that he wanted to be an organist after hearing the sound of the organ in his local church. This experience had an enormous impact on the young musician, and he later described his first encounter with the organ as follows. I thought it must be sorcery. The variety of timbres, the sustained sound, the magical effects of softness, crescendo and power filled me with a mysterious terror and also with the desire to play that miraculous instrument myself. When Vierne was ten years old, Charles Collan introduced him to the Cavaille Call organ of the Church of Saint-Denis du Saint-Sacrement in Paris. Collan explained to Vierne the workings of the organ and the art of improvisation. This introduction to improvisation was, as you can imagine, a revelation to young Vierne, who wrote of this experience, quote, It was possible to create music effortlessly. I needed no other inspiration. Around this time, Charles Collin also brought Vierne to hear César Franck play at the Church of Saint Clotilde. Frank's playing made such an overwhelming impression on ten-year-old Vierne that he burst into tears and had to be carried out of the church. Only a couple of months after he had brought Vierne to hear Frank play, Charles Collin caught a severe cold and died from pneumonia at the age of just 49. His death had a profound effect on young Vierne, whose musical training had been mapped out by his benevolent uncle. Later the same year, Vierne began studying as a boarder at the National Institute for the Young Blind in Paris. He found the separation from his family difficult and the strict regimented lifestyle challenging. He was not inspired by the rigorous, though not exactly well-rounded academic programme, which he described in later life as an intellectual prison. Nonetheless, Vierne received an excellent musical training from the fine teachers at the Institute. He excelled in the study of the violin and the piano, as well as in the study of harmony.
In his last couple of years at the Institute for the Young Blind, Vierne entered César Franck's organ class at the Paris Conservatoire. It was at this stage that Vierne be began to win his first prizes as a composer. An early composition, a movement for piano quartet, was complimented by Franck, who told Vierne that it sounded very youthful and Schumann-esque, but nonetheless saw in it a great deal of potential. Franck impressed upon Vierne the importance of applying himself to the study of strict counterpoint, a subject that Vierne found challenging, owing to his self-professed aversion to all things mathematical. Franck, who himself was an adept contrapuntalist, explained to Vierne that a composer that mastered strict compositional styles learned also the means to break rules intelligently. When reflecting later in life, Vierne realised that Franck's advice had an enormous effect on his development as a composer. Vierne believed that the hallmark of an independent artistic mind was the ability to understand rules and strictures and to adapt them creatively. Conversely, he saw the outright rejection of conventions as a recipe for stylistic anarchy. According to the canonical narrative of musical progress, this attitude makes Vierne a conservative and places him quite apart from his avant-garde contemporaries such as Eric Satie. Vierne and Satie were close contemporaries of the Paris Conservatoire. Vierne was a star pupil. Satie was a failure. Vierne's success at the Conservatoire gained him the admiration of older musicians such as Alexandre Guillemot and Charles-Marie Vidor, about whom a little more later. In contrast, Satie, who embraced the avant-garde milieu of fin de siècle Paris, wore his failures at the Conservatoire as a badge of honour. Vierne entered into the well-worn professional path of organist-composer, a career that the musical establishment centred around the Conservatoire had always considered to be a secure option for French musicians. But although Vierne embarked on a conservative career path, his musical ethos, combined with his fertile imagination, set him apart from his contemporaries. Anyone who has heard Vierne's music could hardly describe it as conservative. In fact, it is so quite unlike anything else that it sounds strikingly modern, even to our 21st century ears. I'm reminded of Stravinsky's comment about Beethoven's Grosse Fugue. Like that work, Vierne's music will sound contemporary forever. The organ, as we have heard, was Vierne's great love. It inspired him at a young age, and his technical gifts as an organist and improviser influenced the colour, texture and harmonic style of his compositions. Not just the organ works, but all of his music. The sound of the organ was the prism through which Vierne reflected his musical ideas. But we know also that he was a gifted pianist and violinist, and we can see this in his idiomatic writing for the piano and for stringed instruments. Unlike many other organist composers, Vierne's piano music is an extensive, challenging and distinct repertoire of its own. These works are not often performed, but Vierne's complete piano music has been recorded extremely well by the French pianist Olivier Gardon. Vierne's contribution to the organ repertoire is extremely varied. At one end, there are the small-scale works, such as the Messe Basse and the 24 Pièces en Steel Libre, designed to be playable on either the organ or the harmonium, an instrument which was then extremely popular in, pa in France. Then there are the suites and character pieces, the most extensive set being the 24 Pièces de Fantasy, which contain some of the most vivid examples of tone painting and textural invention in the entire organ repertoire from the impressionistic canvas of Claire de Lune to the gothic drama of Cathédrale and the triumphant blaze of Carrion de Westminster. But it is Vierne's six organ symphonies that are his towering masterpieces and arguably his greatest contributions to the organ repertoire. 
The urn's music is, however, rarely heard in performance today outside organ recitals. He inhabits the same pantheon as Vidor and Tournemir and Carr Gellert and Rager, to name just a few of the composers who were highly regarded as all-rounders in their lifetime, but are now known only to organ music enthusiasts. But Vierne, the organist composer, is only one side of his musical personality. Though the organ music is arguably the most inventive and idiomatic of all his compositions, owing to his intimate knowledge of organ sonority and technique, his musical achievements stand apart from this particular instrumental idiom. Like his mentor César Franck, Vierne's compositional gifts were not bound only to the medium of his preferred instrument, and in fact he wrote vocal, chamber and orchestral works with the same degree of flair and colour that he wrote for the organ. Perhaps in this year, in which we mark Vierne's 150th anniversary, we organists should look beyond Vierne's organ music and try to appreciate his whole musical personality. At the same time, the wider music-loving public will find in Vierne's organ music, and in particular the symphonies, a manifestation of musical imagination that brought symphonic proportions and techniques to the medium of the solo instrumental performance. Pipeworks artistic director David Lee will next Sunday evening present a performance of Vierne's monumental Fifth Symphony. The Fifth, composed between 1923 and 1924, is Vierne's longest and most ambitious organ symphony, and in many respects it marks the zenith of his compositional style. Today, by way of a more general introduction to Vierne's organ symphonies, I'm going to go back a quarter of a century before Vierne wrote his fifth symphony to his very first organ symphony, published in 1899, when the composer was just 29 years old. This work had quite a long gestation. Vierne had begun writing it in 1895. It was Charles-Marie Vidor who had become professor of organ at the Paris Conservatoire after César Franck's death in 1890, who no doubt had a lot to do with young Vierne's trying his hand at writing an organ symphony. Vierne worked very closely with Vidor as his assistant at both the Conservatoire and at the Church of Saint-Sulpice. It was Vierne's access to the Cavaille Col organ of Saint-Sulpice that inspired his first symphonic composition. By the time Vierne began writing his first organ symphony, Vidor had already published eight of his ten organ symphonies. Although Vidor made the most numerous contributions to this genre, he was not the first composer to write an organ symphony. That distinction, in fact, rests with a relatively obscure German organist composer, Wilhelm Volkmar, who published his five-movement symphony for organ in 1867, five years before Vidor published his first four symphonies. Both Volkmar's composition and Vidor's early symphonies have much more in common with the multi-movement suite than they do with the orchestral symphony. The movements have titles such as Cavatina, Intermezzo, Pastoral, which easily stand apart from the overall composition as character pieces. In these earlier works, the term symphony refers more to the sound of the romantic organ than it does to any compositional style or technique. In spite of Vierne's close relationship with Vidor, his first symphony is dedicated not to Vidor, but to another of his mentors, Alexandre Guillemot. When Vidor gave up the organ professorship at the Paris Conservatoire to begin to become professor of composition in 1896, Guillemot succeeded him as professor of organ, <coughs> and Vierne remained as assistant organ professor. Vidor's elevation to the professorship of composition is significant, for although Vidor was a virtuoso organist, it seemed that he considered himself a composer first. Guillemot, on the other hand, was an organist first. His compositional output is mostly music for his own instrument. By the time Vierne completed his first symphony, Guillemot, who was then in his 60s, 
had already published six of his eight organ sonatas. It is worth comparing these works to Vidor's symphonies, although the title Sonata seems to cast them in a more old-fashioned mould than Vidor's symphonies, an examination of Guillemont's sonatas shows that these are totally structured works in the traditional three-movement form. Vierne's first symphony shows the influence of the multi-movement structure of Vidor's symphonies, but it also shows the rigorous organisation of musical ideas and the imaginative contrasting textures that characterise Guillemont's sonatas. However, the strongest influence upon Vierne's first symphony was that of the teacher that Vierne admired the most, his early mentor César Franck. Although Franck never wrote an organ symphony of his own, he was perhaps the first composer to bring symphonic techniques to the solo organ repertoire. His Grande Pièce Symphonique was composed and premiered in the early 1860s, but it wasn't published until after Volkmar's symphony appeared in 1867. In the Grande Pièce Symphonique, Franck used the compositional techniques that he had learned from Franz Liszt's symphonic poems, in which the structure of a large piece was held together with small musical ideas that were developed continually throughout the piece. The derivation of several themes from the same motivic germ was called thematic transformation or thematic meta metamorphosis. This technique brought a sense of structural cohesion to a large-scale work. The reuse of the same thematic material throughout several sections or movements was known as cyclic form. As well as the sense of structural cohesion that this brought to a work, it also brought a sense of rhetorical and emotional unity to the music. In Franck's works, the strong expressive quality was enhanced by his use of chromatic harmonic language. It was Franck's conception of the symphonic form and his musical language that most influenced Vierne's approach to writing his first organ symphony. <coughs> Vierne's first symphony in the key of D minor is the only one of the symphonies to have six movements. The others all have five movements. Although, in a way, the first two movements, a prelude and a fugue, belong together. However, the prelude is not merely a prelude to the fugue, but rather a prelude to the entire symphony, for it contains within its 88 bars the musical seeds from which the later movements grow. Vierne himself in later life considered this movement to be a fine creation even in spite of the youthfulness he saw in the rest of the symphony. The single motif that unites the rest of the movements together can be found in the very opening bar of the prelude. The falling perfect fourth from D to A in the right hand is not only a unifying melodic device, but also a unifying harmonic device, and many of the harmonic progressions are related by falling perfect fourths. Although the use of this motif, both melodically and harmonically, is not always readily audible, it underpins the musical material of this movement and subsequent movements until its return in a triumphant major key final presentation in the last movement. The third and fourth bars of the prelude give us a first glimpse of a twisting chromatic dotted note melodic idea that appears in various guises throughout the later movements. The structuring of this first movement is remarkably taut. It is unified by the falling fourth idea heard in the opening bar that I pointed out already. This idea comes back in bar 10 in the left hand. 
Here it's presented in the relative major, F major. Vierne takes this falling fourth idea and then inverts it. We first hear this inversion in the dominant minor. It becomes a rising fourth. Although the presentation of this motif in the dominant minor with the note E in the bass creates an unstable harmonic effect. This sense of harmonic instability is increased by the introduction at bar 26 of a rising and then falling semiquaver idea. This idea is an elaboration of the twisting chromatic idea that we heard at the beginning in dotted quavers and semiquavers, and it creates an increasingly restless effect. In bar 33, the music finally arrives in the key of A minor, which has been hinted at for a number of bars, but the sense of arrival doesn't last very long, and it's offset by the introduction of a new idea, which is also based on the falling fourth motif, but here it's presented as a downwards cascade from right hand to left hand and then to pedal, <clears throat> before the twisting chromatic idea appears and takes over in the left hand. We don't linger long in A minor, as you can see, and these bubbling semiquavers become more relentless as the music shifts quickly and quite strikingly up a semitone to the key of B flat minor, where we hear the cascading idea once again. Here it's increasing in volume and intensity. Another surprising tonal shift brings us up one further semitone from B flat minor to B minor, and the opening falling fourth motif is heard once again, but this time <clears throat> it's accompanied by a restless semiquaver motive in the pedal part, which has now become completely pervasive. <laughs> After this, the music moves by more conventional tonal shifts, falling down a fourth to F sharp minor, and then falling another fourth using that same motif that is underpinning the whole um, movement, down to C sharp minor. And it's C sharp minor where the music rests for a short while, as the texture becomes thinner, higher, and more ethereal. The falling fourth motif appears again then in the pedal, accompanied by this high up demi semiquaver texture in the manuals. The move from C sharp minor back to the home key of D minor is an excellent example of how Vierne uses striking textural effects and harmonic progressions to great dramatic effect. The music moves chromatically from C sharp to B to B flat and then we hear a B flat seventh chord gradually increasing in volume in the pedal line rising higher and higher <clears throat> until we get to a long trail and crescendo in bar 65 which leaves us waiting for a resolution. When the resolution finally arrives it's not where we expect it to go but it goes right back to the home key of D minor where we hear the opening theme, the falling fourth, played triple forte in octaves in the pedal, with busy demi semiquaver accompaniment in the manuals.
after this monumental prelude, with its tossing and turning through different tonal spheres, the fugue that follows seems at first rather one-dimensional in character. Vierne himself, later in life, thought that it was well-written, but heavy-handed, as he put it. The registration that he indicates is much less orchestral in style than that indicated in the opening movement, which called for 16 foots, 8 foots, 4 foots and reeds. In the fugue, he only asks for 8 and 4 foot stops with a plange on the positif, a registration that presents a much clearer and more classical texture for this intricate contrapuntal movement. The fugue subject is based around a diminished seventh chord, but it's treated conservatively with a real answer and a regular counter subject. Exposition concludes with an extended codetta that leads into a very long episode. The long episode is based on a rising rather than falling fourth motif, which is marked here in red. There's plenty of imitation in this episode and some tonal wandering, but nothing quite comparable with the harmonic peregrination of the prelude. A middle entry with the subject inverted in the pedal arrives at bar 55 and have a listen just to the pedal line on its own. A skillfully handled stretto entry which shows just how good Vierne was at counterpoint and how much he had applied himself to its study on Frank's advice begins here at bar 84. The stretto entries are marked there in red. After the conclusion of this stretto, the fugal texture gradually breaks down and the music becomes more excited until the beginning of a coda marked Fantasia, which has a distinctly improvised feel. The movement ends with a triple forte statement of the fugue subject concluding on the chord of D major. This final suspension and resolution sounds like something almost out of the Baroque era. Although Vierne included a fugal section in the second movement of the fourth symphony, the first symphony has the only example of a standalone fugue. Some scholars have seen this pairing of a prelude and fugue as an homage to J.S. Bach, but because of what we know about young Vierne's compositional ethos, and the influence of César Franck, it seems more likely that his inclusion of a skillfully worked out fugue was a tribute to Franck's influence. The pairing of a harmonically complex prelude with a rigorously academic fugue suggests a tribute by Vierne to both sides of his mentor's musical character. The third movement, Pastoral, has a graceful and bucolic character that sounds less like Franck and more like Vidor. The opening pedal theme is a metamorphosis of the brooding falling forth theme of the prelude, here transformed into a lighter and more buoyant idea.
Vieren treats this idea to a brief fugal exposition. The entry is there marked in red. And he develops both the subject and the counter subject before introducing a recapitulation of the opening section with some added chromaticism. After this, we hear a contrasting, faster minor key section. A rare instance of Vierne's use of the vox humana with tremulant, a sonority so beloved by Frank and so often used to great effect in his organ works. The fourth movement, headed Allegro Vivace, is a scherzo in all but name. The unpredictable rhythmic accents, the disjointed phrasing, and the capricious chromaticism all prefigure the scherzos of Vierne's later symphonies. These scherzos are imbued with a caustic sense of humour and present musical memorials of Vierne's infamously sharp wit. The middle section of this movement, with its canonic treatment of a soft, reedy left-hand melody, is distinctly Frankian. Vierne in later life considered this movement, along with the prelude, to be the best moments of the first symphony. The fifth movement, headed Andante but with the tempo direction quasi adagio, is in the key of F major. It is lush and romantic in texture owing to the rich expressive chromaticism and the use of the swell strings. A sense of tonal uncertainty pervades this movement. The dominant note C is heard at the very beginning and sounds in the bass until bar 9. The home key is frequently hinted at, but Vierne leaves us waiting until the very end of the movement before we finally hear a firm cadence in the home key of F major. The middle section of this movement moves to the flattened submediant key of D flat major, a favourite tonal relationship of late Romantic composers, by way of a remarkable modulating section based on a recitative like idea that recalls the shape of the swirling chromatic idea of the opening movement, here transformed into something rather different. The section that follows is lyrical but extremely contrapuntally complex, written in five parts, two of which are played in the pedal. This amply demonstrates Vierne's skill at writing chromatic counterpoint whilst maintaining a graceful and lilting character. The final movement of the First Symphony is one of Vierne's most famous creations though in many ways it is quite atypical of his style. Although Vierne frequently played it in his own recitals, later in life he considered it to be, quote, horribly pompous and lacking in taste. It is my Marseillaise, he said, 
not intending that comparison to be a positive one. Regardless of Vierne's mature rejection of this early work, it forms a brilliant conclusion to the symphony. The main motif, heard at the outset in the pedal, is based on the falling fourth motif of the very opening movement. Here, after several movements in which this simple but sombre idea was continually metamorphosed, it is heard here as a bouncing and triumphant gesture that puts one in mind of the sound of the timpani. This is just one of the aspects of the musical material of this finale that lends the movement a martial character. Later on, we have running scale patterns and chromatically inflected melodic lines, which recall the writhing stepwise melodies of the prelude, but here they appear finally transfigured into the brightness of D major. Here's a little excerpt of the opening. I hope this brief introduction to Vierne's symphonic works will give you some more insight into the musical personality of this wonderful composer. There is much to enjoy in his colourful and varied musical output, and not just the organ music. I hope in particular that the discussion of the first organ symphony might give you fresh ears with which to listen to David Lee's performance next Sunday evening of Vierne's mighty fifth symphony, the largest and arguably most demanding of all of Vierne's organ works. In the meantime, you might like to watch David's recording of the first symphony as performed in St. Patrick's Cathedral during his most recent complete Vierne symphonies cycle in August 2018. Thank you for watching and good night. <laughs>